Hello everyone. In this video, I want to show you an example of design for fatigue in real life. And here we are going to look at a, uh, a crushing mechanism, which is the same as the piston mechanism, is slider crank. So, uh, but instead of the piston, the input coming from the uh, piston and the output going to the crankshaft, here the input is applied to the crankshaft and the output is uh, the force taken from the piston to crush like rocks or anything like that, okay? So the input is uh, this angle theta 2 or its angular acceleration or velocity or the torque that you apply on this joint. Uh, the dimensions here for L2 and L3, we got them from some kind of typical uh, crankshaft and Conrad uh, dimensions. So L2 is about four and a half centimeters. L3 is 17 and a half centimeters. The mass of the piston is about uh, 750 grams. The mass of the Conrad we neglected. That's not necessarily true. This mass of Conrad is about like 650 grams or something. But here we neglect it for simplicity in the calculations and I'll tell you why. Uh, we assume that we can keep the uh, input member, the angular velocity of the input member, omega 2, at constant 3000 RPM. Okay, so we keep the input at uh, 3000 RPM constant, which means alpha number 2, the angular acceleration of this member is 0. And uh, we also neglect the friction on the piston between the piston and this guide. You see it is moving on this uh, kind of a dark uh, gray or black member. And the friction here between these two, we again neglect it. We can uh, add that, but here we just go ahead and for simplicity just neglect it. So what is it that we need to design here? All we need to design is the pin that goes here between the conrod in green and the piston in gray. The pin that fills this space here, this pin, if we want to basically design a pin for that area, what should be the diameter of it, right? If we call it D pin, what should be this D pin and from what material we should uh, basically um, pick this pin and its dimension or geometry so that uh, it can withstand the fatigue in uh, this mechanism. The length of this, because we know this is a cylinder, right? The length of this we keep at a uh, length of this pin. We assume this is five centimeters. And we're going to look at a simple example of a design here. So, First of all, why is it a fatigue design? Is the load on this pin variable versus time? Absolutely, I'll show you that. Although this input omega is constant, the loads on these members are not. Well, let's see why. So here, if you go about the uh, geometric relations between these different length, L2, L3, uh, the distance of the piston, XP, and angle theta 2, theta 3, you can see that xp equals l2 cosine theta 2 plus l3 cosine theta 3 and also l2 sine theta 2 plus l3 sine theta 3 equals 0 where theta 3 here is measured from the horizontal axis to this line so theta 3 is basically not this angle it's like 2 pi minus that so sine of it is negative of sine of this angle right and so we have this relation Okay, so uh, this is what this is what we have over here. Now, if I know angle theta two at any point, if that angle is given to me, why? Because I know omega of it. So the angle theta two is simply what, since omega is constant, that's omega two times t plus initial angle of theta two, right? Because it's constant omega. So at any time point t, I should be able to find theta 2. And if I have theta 2 in these two equations, I should be able to find for the, uh, solve for the two other unknowns, which are theta 3 and x of p. From this bottom equation, I solve for theta 3, right? You can clearly see here, theta 3 could be basically um, 
it's sine inverse of uh, negative L2 sine of uh, theta 2, right, divided by, this is L2 divided by L3. Okay, so from here, I should be able to find theta 3, and then if I plug it into this top equation, I can find xp. So I can do complete position analysis. Next, I need to find the velocities and the accelerations from this formula. And what I really care about is acceleration of the piston. Why? Because that determines the force on the piston. Okay, that determines the uh, pin reactions at this piston. So I need to find x double dot of p. So I need to take time derivative two times from this equation. First, I take one time derivative. And uh, you can see that if you take time derivative, time derivative of cosine theta 2 is negative sine theta 2 times omega 2. Here you have to use chain rule. The derivative of uh, theta 3 cosine is negative theta 3 sine and uh, times omega 3. And then x is x dot p. And here uh, sine theta 2 is cosine theta 2 omega 2. Sine theta 3 is cosine theta 3 omega 3. So here, now again, if you know omega 2, which is given, that's a fixed number, you should be able to solve for the two unknowns, omega 3 and x dot p. And again, you can find omega 3 from the bottom equation, right? Once, once you know the angles from the top one, and omega 2, once you know all of these, you can find omega 3, plug it into top one, and find x dot, x dot p. Another way is you can write these equations in a matrix format and you can write it like this. Okay, where the left hand side matrix is entirely known because you know angle theta 3 and the right hand side is also known because you know theta 2 and because you know omega 2. So you should be from this uh, in a matrix relation, you should be able to uh, invert this uh, coefficient matrix, multiply by the right hand side and solve for omega 3 and x dot p if you need them. Now, do you need them? Yes. Specifically, omega-3 you need later in acceleration analysis. So if you want to find the acceleration terms, you need to know the omega of member 3. You don't need x dot p, but you definitely need omega-3. So you have to find it. Now, I take another time derivative from this relation, or that one, doesn't matter. And if I do that, then I can show you that the acceleration formula if you write it in a matrix format, it's going to be what you can see here in the bottom, where the coefficient matrix is the same as what you had for the velocity, but the right-hand side is different. Here you have the tangential accelerations, you have the centripetal accelerations, okay, that you can see here and here. And again, once you know omega 2, omega 3, theta 2, theta 3, all of this right-hand side is known. This left-hand side coefficient matrix is known. So you should be able to solve for both alpha 3, the angular acceleration of member 3, and x double dot p acceleration of the piston. You might say, what is alpha 2? Remember that alpha 2 has to be what? 0, because this member moves with constant omega. Okay, so let's say we did all the solutions. As we uh, change the time and as we change theta 2, and we calculate what? We calculate this important term here, this acceleration of the piston. Let me show you the result of that before we go to force analysis. So all you have seen so far, all of these, was just kinematics analysis, just motion only. So here, uh, this is what I have. These are those um, two different uh, values of L2 and L3. And you see omega 2 in RPM is 3000. I convert it to radians per second by multiply by 2 pi divided by 60. And then uh, you need to look at one full cycle. You need to look at the variables in one full cycle. So you can see all of the values in one cycle when they keep repeating themselves after the cycle. So you go from 0 to this time. What is this time? This time is 2 pi over omega of member 2. So this time here is the period of one rotation in seconds for member number two, or the period of one cycle. So you see, I divided the angle 2 pi by the omega, which is converted into radians per second. So that gives me so many seconds. And this number in this case is about uh, 0.02. 
or 20 milliseconds. So it, at 3000 RPM, it only takes 20 milliseconds for crankshaft to do one uh, full rotation. So I break down the time between zero and 20 milliseconds to 100 equally distance points. And uh, this is going to be my vector t. You see my omega is simply omega times ones of length of t. So my vector omega 2 is constant and my vector alpha 2 is just a bunch of zeros, as you can see. Then I go from ii from 1 to length of t. I uh, basically plug in all of these instantaneous equations that I have, right? So uh, basically I first, as I said in this top equation, I solve for theta 3. Then go down to the bottom equation, solve for omega 3. And then go to the final equation and solve for what? For uh, x double dot of p. And uh, also, I have calculated x of p and x dot of p. Okay? So I've calculated all of those as well. And uh, you can see all of these calculations are here. Now here, I assume if you want to have constant velocity motion, then you can also... Uh, constant acceleration motion, I'm sorry. If you want constant acceleration motion, then you can include your alpha as well. But in this case, our alphas are zero. So basically, this is the same as what? This is the same as getting rid of this part, okay? Because your alphas are zero. And here we assume that uh, theta two at time zero is also what? Zero. Let's assume you start from a zero angle. So your theta two is simply omega two times t. And here you see the theta three formula, the piston formula. I form that coefficient matrix. Here, this coefficient matrix, I call it Jacobian, and that's actually the definition of Jacobian here. And uh, then I can find my velocity terms, I can find my acceleration terms, and then here I'm going to plot all of those things. And let me show you something interesting. So you see here your theta 2 is increasing linearly with time because it's constant omega times t. But if you look at your position of the piston, it's not constant. You might say it looks like constant. It is because of the uh, dimensions. It's not really. And your theta 3 also does not uh, go constant. If I bring down the range, you can clearly see both of them are kind of like a sine wave. And you can see that here, right? So uh, let me show you. Get this out of the way. So you can see clearly that theta 3 is showing kind of like a sine wave. And if you look at the uh, position of the piston, also it has a, a wave in it, right? If you zoom further, you can see it probably better too that the uh, position of the piston is also uh, not constant. And of course it's not. It goes forward, then it comes backward, right? So you see it goes uh, forward, it goes down, and then it comes back up, okay, as it moves to the left and right. So nothing is uh, really constant or linear. If you look at the velocities also, you see velocity of the piston omega 2 is constant, right? But if you look at the Conrad angular velocity omega 3, that is not constant. And also if you look at the piston velocity, that is not constant too. Again, here the piston velocity, you have to zoom in to see the wave better. But if you do zoom in, you clearly see that the velocity of the piston is a wave. And for half of the cycle is negative, for the other half is positive. And that's obvious. As half of the cycle piston moves to the left, the other half it moves to the right. So you're going to get a, a, a basically a wave. And the same thing for acceleration. You see here, alpha 2 is perfectly zero. But alpha 3 of the Conrad is clearly not zero. It's actually very big numbers. And the piston acceleration in meters per second also, if you look at that, that is not zero and that is even not constant, okay? It follows this kind of pattern here. So uh, nothing is really constant about the Conrad or about the uh, piston. Everything is uh, time variable, okay? So you see that the acceleration of the piston is clearly variable. It has negative values and it has positive values. And it's not like a perfect uh, sine wave or something, okay? So these are what, these are the kinematics analysis. Now let's go ahead and look at what, look at the forces. 
That is what we did all of this for. So here, this is the piston. It has uh, four forces on it, or um, if you count the components of this F. So you have the MG, you have the N from the guide that it is moving on. As we said, this friction here, right? Either to the left or to the right, depending on the direction of motion that we neglected. And what we have the pin reaction. And this pin reaction, it has X component and it has what? Y component in general, right? But here, uh, there is something special about this force. What is it? Well, if you remember for this uh, Conrad, we said that the mass of Conrad is negligible. So we set this to zero. If that is zero, then the forces on the pins, right? So the force that you have on the bottom pin of the Conrad and the top pin of the Conrad, they have to be along the member. In other words, this Conrad has to be what? It has to be a two force member. Okay, the Conrad has to be a two-force member, right? Because the mass is uh, negligible, and that makes life a lot easier. If we don't go with that assumption, then we have to do a lot more calculations. And whether it's a real valid assumption or not, it's uh, here just used for simplification. In reality, this mass is not much smaller than the mass of the piston. Okay, so the assumption of two force member for Conrad here is just done to simplify a little bit. If you want to be accurate, that is not really valid. So what's good about it? Now this F, this force F uh, applied uh, on the pin and on the piston accordingly, that we know the angle of it. The angle of it is the same as theta 3. Or in this case, 2 pi minus theta 3, right? And uh, all we need is just the magnitude of this F to find. Now, uh, if we look at the uh, free body diagram here, then you know that the X component of the piston force is the only force that is applied in the horizontal direction. There is nothing else here, right? There is no other force applied in this direction. So I can write as basically F times cosine of theta 3 or 2 pi minus theta 3, which has the same cosine. That should be equal to mass of the piston times acceleration of the piston in the X direction because there is no friction. And if I know this angle at any point, and if I know this acceleration at any point, and I know the mass of the piston, I should be able to calculate my what? My total force on the pin, okay, or on the piston. Because that pin applies that force to the piston too, and we can, for pin, we can say the mass is a small. So we can approximate the force on the pin to be also applied on the piston. Okay, as I said, this is just because of the two force assumption. If that's not the case, then you cannot consider this angle here. You have to say your force has a Y component and it has an X component. The X component of it is equal to what? Equal to that. But the Y component, you cannot easily get it. For Y component, you have to go to this free body diagram. And since this guy has four unknowns, you cannot find all of them, so now you have to go back to the crankshaft. And uh, if you know the torque that is applied on the crankshaft, which in this case we uh, didn't really put it in, then yes, from all of these free body diagrams, you should be able to solve for uh, six uh, unknowns. Because you have two reactions here, you have two reactions here, and you have two reactions there. Six Reactions and each free body diagram gives you six equations, so you should be able to solve for all of them. F of X is already calculated from the piston, so uh, you have five unknowns, and you should be ultimately able to find this Fy, and then F, this F force is going to be square root of X, Fx squared plus what? Fy squared. Okay, so it makes the calculations a lot more um, involved, but uh, here, just for simplicity, we go with this assumption. 
So this is that formula I wrote for you. Remember, I know my theta 3 at any point in the cycle. I know my acceleration of the piston, that is the x dot double p. I know the mass of the piston, so I should be able to find the piston force. Now that I know the piston force, let's go ahead and plot that as well. Uh, so here, if we go to my MATLAB code, you can see that I calculated my piston force in the x direction. I uh, multiply by tangent theta to go with y. I use the square root to get uh, the total force magnitude and to apply the correct uh, direction for it. I multiply the piston force by the sine of the piston velocity. And that is for when basically the piston is moving here to the left, then uh, this is your piston velocity in this way, x dot of p, then of course the pin force should be this way as well, right, to drag it, and when you move to the right, then this pin force should be to the right to drag it. So here, since the f here is just a magnitude, I went about correcting the sign of it this way, okay? Because this force becomes positive and negative, right? This force uh, will uh, change the direction, so we have to account for that. And here is uh, that force. And if you look at this force, you clearly see that uh, this force does change versus uh, time in the cycle. This force is not constant, so the stress coming from this force on the pin is not going to be constant too, right? And for that reason, uh, this is clearly a fatigue design, okay? So you have to use that force and go about the fatigue design. So how do we do that? Well, uh, the pin uh, is connected to the... Uh, it's uh, basically the pin passes through the hole in the con rod, in the head of the con rod. And since this is like your uh, pin and the con rod head is like this, okay? So if it cuts the pin, then you're going to have a, a double shear, right? Because it is going to be cut on this surface and it is going to be cutting on this surface. So here I divide my F by two times a cross section of the pin, and that is going to be my shear stress tau xy. Also, this uh, two ends of the um, pin are fixed into the piston, right? So this is like a, a kind of simply supported beam, right? And this force F that you apply here in the middle that force F is going to cause bending. So the bending stress, uh, sigma X, is negative M times Y over I, and the maximum of it is negative M max Y max over I. Y max happens at the top and the bottom of the pin, and M max clearly happens in the middle of the pin here, if this force is F, then the uh, basically the contact forces, the bearing forces, are both going to be F over 2, right? And if the length of this pin is L, which as I said, we consider it like 5 centimeters, right? So the maximum moment here in the middle is going to be this length, which is L over 2, right? times the force F over 2. So the maximum moment should be FL over 4, which you can see over here. And uh, again, if we consider it a simply supported beam, right? It's not like a perfectly simply supported beam, but here again, we go with simplifications. So, and Y max is clearly half of the diameter of the pin, D over 2, and this I, the uh, cross section second moment, is going to be pi over uh, 64 times d to the 4. Okay, so uh, we can find this sigma, which has maximum at above and below, and tau, which is constant over all cross section. And then, 
in order to find the maximum sigma and minimum sigma, we have to use the Mohr circle formula. We have to use the principal stress. In this case, your sigma y is zero, so you only have sigma x and tau. Therefore, the principal formulas are going to be sigma x plus sigma y over 2. Again, remember sigma y is zero, plus minus the square root of sigma x minus sigma y over 2, right? Which again is zero and uh, over 2 squared, and uh, then what? Plus tau xy uh, squared. So it is going to be what you can see over here. So one of them is going to be my maximum sigma, one of them is going to be my minimum sigma in this case. And um, here, if we go to the MATLAB code, these are those calculations. You see m is f uh, piston times l piston divided by 4. Tau is absolute value of F piston divided by A divided by 2 for double shear. Then I find my sigma 1 and sigma 2. And then just to make sure, I use the maximum of them, call it sigma max. And the minimum of them, I call it sigma min. Okay. And then uh, here, we need to find the mid-range stress sigma M and the amplitude stress sigma A that we learned in my previous video on fatigue. We need to find sigma M and sigma A. Sigma M is as average of the two. Sigma A is uh, the difference between the two divided by half and the absolute value of it. Now that I know sigma M and sigma A, I can go to the Goodman method. In Goodman method, if you remember, the formula was that uh, basically uh, sigma uh, M divided by SUT and then plus uh, sigma A divided by uh, SE, right? This one was 1 over N or 1 over safety factor. Okay, so here you see that I divide my sigma E by S, E sigma M by S, T. And then when I add them, I take a reciprocal to get my safety factor. But before that, you might say, how did you get your sigma uh, E, S, E, sorry, S, E and S, T? For that, I did a little bit of what fatigue calculations for you here. So I assume that I used the steel with uh, 1200 megapascal SUT and uh, since the working temperature inside the engine is between 190 to 210 or 220 Fahrenheit I went with uh, 200 and I looked at the uh, tables for KD remember uh, my previous lecture you still remember that we had these uh, tables where you could go and look at the temperature and find the ratio of the um, S, which is uh, modified for temperature, over what you read from the tables. So that number is 1.02. So I multiply that by that 1200 to get my ST. And I'm going to use this one instead of what? SUT all over the place. Okay, so use this uh, in place of SUT in uh, fatigue formulas. Okay, so now I go and look at that formula one, right, uh, based on this new number, which is 1.02 times 1200, which is still below 1400 psi, and, uh, or 1400 megapascal, sorry, in this case. So the formula I have to use is still half of SUT for S prime E. That's what I have here. For the surface of the pin, I assume it's machined. So if you go and look at the tables for the uh, surface uh, uh, coefficient Ka, you find A to be 4.51 and B to be point, negative 0.26. Uh, so you can see that over here. And since this is in megapascal, we have to go with this number and this number. And the number we have to use uh, as SUT, we have to make sure that number is given in megapascal. You should not pass the number in Pascal, otherwise your Ka is going to be extremely small. So uh, you see here, I divided my ST by 1 million, to, so I get just simply this 1200 times 1.02, then uh, mul uh, multiply, raise it to the BN multiplied by A to get my Ka. And this Ka is uh, really um, 
not a small number, okay? I'll show you it's about 0.8 something. Uh, the next thing is, in this case, the uh, pin is not rotating, is not spinning. So we have to use the equivalent formula, the uh, dimension equivalent. And remember, I said that if the working piece is circular but not rotating, the equivalent diameter is 0.37 times D. So that is what I have here. The only thing is, uh, in order to use the formula in KB, this D has to be converted into millimeters. So you see here, I multiplied it also by 1,000. So it becomes in mils. And then I use that formula because it's between the range 2.79 and 51. I use the formula 1.24. So it's this uh, range here, and I use this formula, and pay attention that I go with the bending scenario here, and from here I can find my uh, KB, and uh, for KC, the load is bending, so KC is 1. Uh, for KD, we already used it, so we are not going to use this formula, we just use K of D of 1. We go with 99% reliability and 0.814 for KE. And for miscellaneous, let's say uh, we just ignore all of it and we have perfect condition, which is not the reality, and KF is also 1. So these are all those numbers, and now I multiply them by SE prime to get SE. So now I have SE and I have ST, which I'm going to use in place of SUT. And so down here... I can calculate my what? I can calculate using the uh, Goodman, modified Goodman method, I can calculate my safety factor. And in this second round of plot, you can see that here I have your sigma max and sigma min plotted versus time. Clearly they are changing. And so your sigma m and your sigma a are not going to be constant too. So you, when you calculate them, they are changing as well. And for that reason, your safety factor is not going to be constant too, okay? So uh, this is not really a, a perfect sine wave where you have one sigma m and one sigma a and everything is perfect. So your safety factor uh, can change and we go with the lowest that exists in the whole graph. And in this case, the lowest that you can possibly get, which is from the worst scenario condition, on sigma m and sigma a, the worst safety factor that you can get, as you can see in this plot, is about 1.8. Okay, so here, these regions, these numbers are huge, but if you look at these regions, if you zoom in, you see the safety factor is not that big. I mean, again, because you have some very big numbers, if you zoom in, you see that you have regions that are with lower safety factors. So you start from uh, 1.8 and uh, it goes up. So this is the worst case scenario right at the beginning where you have the maximum accelerations, maximum forces, the start of the motion, and the safety factor there, the minimum is about 1.8, which is still good. Okay, and uh, how did I calculate all of this? That's because in the beginning, I chose my diameter for the pin and I chose my material. So if my uh, smallest safety factor is less than one point, is less than one, or whatever the uh, engineering uh, standards dictate, then I have to come back here and make this diameter bigger. Or uh, if I don't have too much room for a bigger diameter, because you know bigger diameter on the pin means bigger stress concentration on the piston. So I cannot really make it super big, okay? I have some limitations on this number. Then I have to improve my material. I have to use a higher grade material, okay? So here, all you need is to make this one uh, 0.1, right? Make it a smaller pin and make this guy uh, like 1,000, right? Megapascal or 800 or 900 and run it again and you'll see that with a poor choice of uh, material and dimension, now look, your safety factor minimum goes to 0.91, which is failure, right? So uh, as I said, this is a um, multivariable optimization. You have control over material, you have control over dimension. Uh, you might not have control over other things like the type of loading, the temperature, and so many other things. But these two specifically, material and geometry, you have control over. You can change both of them or one of them, right? 
So here, maybe I go with the same material I have, but the smaller pin, I still can be safe. Although uh, you might not call 1.06 super amazing, but still, theoretically, it's not failure. But clearly, plastic deformation, because remember, Goodman method uses SUT, not SY. So if I use the Soderberg method, this would definitely would have been a failure because the pin will deform plastically, and once the pin will deform plastically, everything would change accordingly. So I better what? I better use better material here, and uh, maybe if I can, use a little bit better pin, stronger pin, and uh, make sure that it does not even hopefully go with what? With plastic deformation here. Okay, I can improve that. So I'm gonna upload this file for you and give you a link to download it and play with it. Remember, we did lots of simplifications here, okay? We uh, went about uh, using a two-force member for the Conrad, which is not accurate. We neglected the friction force here a little bit, right? And the model of the beam, the stress uh, formulas we used, again, um, this one is not like super simple, that's okay, but here we consider this like a simply supported beam, relatively reasonable, and uh, the other shear term that we have, uh, which is basically the um, VQ over a TA, that one we just neglected here, we assume that's a small, and uh, there are a bunch of things that we simplified here, a bunch of things. So, I just showed you, if you just simply want to select a simple pin, a simple pin for a piston mechanism, right? And make sure that the diameter and the material of it are good for fatigue, you have to do all of these calculations. You have to do kinematics analysis, you have to do dynamics analysis for at least one full cycle, you have to uh, do all these fatigue calculations, and see if your choices are good and you get a good safety factor or not. Okay, so as I said, fatigue design is a complicated task. Hopefully the video was useful to you. I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.